Hello, welcome back. Now, in the previous videos, you've learned some very important concepts about the properties of megavoltage photon beams. You've learned how to do dose calculations and so on. Uh, and these concepts are very important, but unfortunately, these are really not how things are done nowadays, at least in a modern clinic. What's What you often use to get a good dose calculation is a, a full-on treatment planning system, a computer model that um, describes the dose in a patient. So that's the topic of this video, which is uh, treatment planning systems and how those dose calculation algorithms work and, and what the properties are uh, that you need to understand about them. Here we go. I'm going to go over three different ways that uh, are commonly used to calculate dose. So number one is the pencil beam algorithm uh, and then the modified pencil beam algorithm. These are kind of the simplest versions. Superposition convolution um, and then a solver to the Boltzmann equation and finally Monte Carlo uh, calculation methods. I'm going to start with this simple representation here, a uh, source shown in red and a patient down below. And the goal here is to calculate the dose in the patient. So we draw a line uh, from the source down into the patient. That, that line represents a photon coming out of the source going in. And then I'm going to uh, break the patient up into a dose grid here, discretize it into a three-dimensional grid. These uh, grids are each uh, point is called a voxel. Each box is a three-dimensional pixel or voxel. Uh, the typical size of this grid in modern treatment planning systems is two to four millimeters. Then the goal is to calculate the dose at each of these voxels. So I zoom in here at this point, I want to calculate what is called terma, total energy released in matter. Uh, one thing to be aware of here is that uh, there are inhomogeneities in the patient. Here I'm drawing in black like a lung, for example. And so you want to calculate that. And the terma does it. You calculate the radiological equivalent depth uh, to, for each voxel. And that gives you the attenuation. You could calculate the attenuation. Attenuation. So you do this for other ray lines, and you do it for each voxel in the patient, and then you have a three-dimensional representation. Now that's the actually the simple pencil beam algorithm does really nothing more than that. But here we come to the next level of sophistication. I'm drawing here uh, <clears throat> what's happening inside the patient. So that's uh, scatter in each of these voxels. There's a scatter from the electrons that are produced in the photons and they scatter to different distances and that distance that of scatter is represented by these arrows and a larger arrow representing larger uh, scatter. So here's a big um, scatter. These are called kernels. That's a scatter kernel. And here's a smaller scatter kernel. So that might represent different uh, situations in the patient. And these scale with the density inside the patient. right? So a large kernel here for a low density and a small kernel here for a high density. They also um, depend on the energy of the beam. High energy electrons, bigger, small energy, smaller. So these uh, kernels then <clears throat> can be convolved with the terma with this, uh, it's kind of like an integral. Uh, and you can involve the kernel with the terma to get both the scatter and the incident. And that gives you finally the dose in the patient. These methods are called superposition convolution algorithms. So, so far we've looked at the dose in the patient and the effects that uh, control that. But there are other effects up in the head of the linear accelerator as well, of course. So for example, you consider uh, the red point here, the point source. Well, it's not really a point source. It has some finite dimension. And that's the, the primary source. 
Then in addition, there are other components as well, of course, like the jaws and the collimation system, the ion chamber, uh, the flattening filter that's typically included in these models. All of these uh, things contribute dose into the patient and can be uh, included in the model. So let's have a look at what this looks like in a modern treatment planning system. Here what you're seeing is a particular beam and we have the measured data in red and then the model from the treatment planning system in blue. And what you're looking at here is a depth dose curve. Uh, you can also look at profiles across the beam and you can look at different depths uh, and so on. But if we go back to the uh, percent depth there are certain uh, different parameters in the model that control this and so for example I was talking about the components up in the head of the linear accelerator uh, one of the, the things those contribute are a an electron uh, contamination to the beam that provide that kind of contributes superficial dose to the patient and so here and that's all modeled so you can see here if I turn off the electron contamination, you can see how that changes the depth dose curve, right? In addition, if you go and turn uh, the size of the primary source up, you can see that it changes the width of the penumbra. That sort of makes sense. If you have a bigger source, the penumbra is going to be bigger. So a lot of these effects are modeled in these uh, planning systems. So if we come back then to our list of calculation algorithms, we can list them in terms of increasing accuracy. The simplest version of a dose calculation being the, the TAR or TMR method and Clarkson integrals, not very accurate, especially when there's inhomogeneities. Better than that is a pencil beam algorithm um, that uses convolution in a simple way. An early version of that is the variant pencil beam calculation algorithm. I'm going to show here some actual treatment planning systems and which algorithms they use, just so you're familiar. A little bit better than that is convolution with an invariant kernel. So invariant means that the kernel doesn't scale with the density, so like the kernel in a lung should be bigger than the dose kernel in uh, muscle, right? So these algorithms don't account for that, but they're very fast. They can use the FFT, Fourier, Fast Fourier Transform to do the convolution. CMS XEO uses that. Convolution that includes a source model. An example of that is the, the varying uh, AAA algorithm that they use. Um, <clears throat> and then there is the collapse cone convolution, which is a superposition convolution algorithm like I talked about. Pinnacle and tomotherapy they use that algorithm that was considered the most accurate for a long time. There's a lot of papers, as you can imagine, about this that compare these different algorithms under different scenarios. Um, more recently, in the last three years, there's been a, um, a system that comes out of um, Lawrence Livermore Labs, which actually solves the Boltzmann equation, which the Boltzmann equation has three terms that describe uh, the, basically the diffusion and propagation of, of charged particles in, in matter. It's more general than that, but that's what it's used for here. And so there's been an uh, implementation of that, that Varian has, they call it Acuros. Uh, it's been shown to be more accurate. And then finally, the important uh, algorithm you need to know about is Monte Carlo calculations. And there are not that many planning systems right now uh, that use that because it's, it's somewhat slow, but it's extremely accurate. Monte Carlo basically follows the propagation of all the particles through matter and does a simulation of them particle by particle. And you can set, simulate billions of particles and then build up a dose distribution around that. And it models the fundamental physics interactions of those particles with all the material uh, in the path. That includes scatter off of components of the linac, scatter in the patient, inhomogeneities, and so on. So it's a, a very fundamental way to 
calculate things based on the fundamental physics interaction cross-sections. So we're going to shift topics in this last part of the video and we're going to talk about another patient effect on beams and that is the impact of inhomogeneities. So yeah, the patient is not an even bath of water. There are lungs, bones, other tissues, other hardware, and those all have an impact on the beam. So let's walk through some of that. So I'm going to look at this lung case here. This is the beam shown in the treatment planning system. And you want to look at the properties of this beam. So I am going to extract some data from this paper. Here's the experimental setup that they use. You see an acrylic layer on the top, which simulates soft tissue. There's cork below that, which simulates a lung, and acrylic layer below that. And so they uh, do measurements in this type of setup, and they compare two calculations, and here's what you get. So this is the percent Epsos curve, and you see the green curve, which is the curve with no corrections. So if the lung isn't there, in other words, a homogeneous calculation as if it were water equivalent. When you introduce the lung, things change. The lung is low density here. It's 0.3 grams per cc, which is something you should probably know. And then in, in that case, the curve bumps up. So you'll see it's higher in dose than the curve with no correction. That's easy to understand because the lung is less attenuating. So uh, within the lung and beyond the lung, it's a higher dose. And then you have these different curves here, or measurements, you have the dots for the measurements. And then you have the solid curve, which is the Monte Carlo, which is the most accurate calculation method. And then you have other uh, systems, you have the BAPO power law, you have the equivalent TAR, you have the AAA algorithm used in the variant treatment planning system. All these cases, the dose is higher than it would be with the homogeneous calculation. So now let's look at what this looks like in a planning system. Here I've made a beam with the inhomogeneity correction on on the left and then with it off on the right, assuming everything is water equivalent, in other words. You'll see some differences here, the penumbra. Look at that, it's a little different. It's a little wider when the lung is on. And also there's less attenuation over here with the, uh, with the inhomogeneity in. The blue isodos line extends down here, whereas it's pull, pulled back in the water equivalent case because there's more attenuation over there on the right. Yeah. So there is a field size effect to this as well, so let's look at that. Here's the data that I showed you up here on the upper left. That's a 10 by 10 field. But now on the right here, this is a smaller field. This is a 1 by 1 field, relatively small. And you'll see a huge effect. And what you see here is that the dose decreases in the lung. So the reason for that is that electrons are scattered out of the beam. You don't have electronic equilibrium like you did when it was soft, soft tissue. This outscatter and inscatter aren't balanced, so the dose is reduced substantially inside the lung. So then, uh, to summarize, inhomogeneity should be corrected for in treatment planning. Monte Carlo is the most accurate method, and we'll come back to that a little later. And the effect is largest for small field sizes and for higher energies, where the electron range is larger. And now let's look at uh, the effect of inhomogeneities around a bone, a high density region. So here's again another experimental setup where you can make a measurement. So a beam coming in from the right into a water equivalent material and then bone in the middle. And then here's the measurements of this for a PDD. So you'll see uh, what you see is an enhancement just prior to the bone. That's due to electron backscatter Within the bone, there's uh, differences due to stopping power uh, of the bone and attenuation of the bone. So then to summarize, on the entrance side, there's the effect of backscattered electrons, which are relatively short range, relatively localized. On the forward directed side, there's a contribution from forward scattered electrons and there's are especially um, enhanced and longer range at higher energies where you get more pair production. So these are the effects around an object that has high density 
and high timing number. All right, so there you have it, the basics of dose calculation in treatment planning systems. These systems continue to evolve and change over time, so uh, probably tomorrow this video will be outdated, but this gives you a little basic snapshot of where we are right now. Thank you.